All right. Well, welcome back, everybody, to Ultrasound Grand Rounds this week. I am really excited um, about this week, not only because we are two weeks away from finishing the semester, which means we'll be almost done with this calendar year, uh, but I'm really excited because for this week and next week, we are bringing on two really cool, special guests to join us on our forum today. So uh, I guess we can uh, we'll, we'll reveal it now, um, but we have a Dr. Michael Gottlieb from Rush University Medical School who's joining us today, coming to talk about a very interesting article that he and his team put out. Uh, I'm super excited to have, um, have him here and talk um, with our team about what's going on with airway ultrasound. So Mike, welcome to Ultrasound Grand Rounds here in, I guess today is sunny Cleveland, Ohio. How are you doing today? Thanks for having me. I'm great. I'm excited to talk about our article and airway ultrasound. Yeah. So before we get started, um, let's just talk, let's, I mean, catch our audience up a little bit about you, um, who you are. Um, a lot of, a lot of people who watch this probably know you because I think, uh, you are probably one of the most ubiquitous and prolific publishers in the ED ultrasound space, but, um, briefly just catch us up. Uh, who are you? Why are you here? Where do you, what do you do? And yeah, tell me about yourself. Yeah, so I'm also fellowship trained. I've been the Olson Division Director at Rush in Chicago for approaching close to a decade now. Um, also serve as the Vice Chair of Research and um, have had an, air, an interest in airway ultrasound dating back to residency. It was actually one of my very first Olson projects. Um, I saw the impact it could have, the speed, the efficiency, and it really impacted my practice. And so that's been one of the focal points of my ultrasound research for since dating back to residency, actually. Cool. So you said a decade. So you and I probably went through around the same period of time because I'm uh, as of this year, a decade out of uh, residency and then um, starting July 1st, I'll be a decade out of fellowship. So you and I probably rub shoulders, not knowingly a decade ago as we were on the, the various different trails. Um, but you ended up in Chicago and I ended up here in Cleveland. So that's pretty cool. Um, so what I would like to do here today, uh, I'm going to cut over to um, our slide deck. We're going to talk for just a little bit here um, and just kind of back up, get our audience kind of caught up to speed at where we're at. And then um, we're going to do part two of this um, of, of this session today where I want to dig into this article that you put out, because I think it's really helpful, um, you know, article that will guide and direct some of the care that we give. So um, as always, I have no disclosures. I don't know if Mike has anything to uh, to disclose vis-a-vis uh, -vis ultrasound. Um, but pertaining to um, this topic, if you look back on our YouTube channel, so youtube.com, search for Metro Health Emergency Ultrasound, we've been putting out content uh, for a little while now, just things that are in this forum, the Ultrasound Grand Rounds forum, and then we've recently started up doing some little ultrasound shorts where we can kind of have some topic that we want to hit up that's just really 30 to 40 seconds of kind of a teaching point. But if you look back about, I don't know, it was about a year ago, almost a year ago, nine months ago, we did this talk, POCUS for Air, or POCUS Guided Airway Management. So if you haven't watched that one um, and you're watching on YouTube right now, pause right now, go back to the channel, watch that one while you're at it, uh, share, like, subscribe, all those good things you do on YouTube. If you're live, sorry, you got to keep listening to this. But then when you're done, go back and watch this, um, this video. But anyway, we talked about how to use ultrasound to assess airway, or the airway as we're, as we're, you know, intubating patients in the department and trying to confirm that. And what we talked about in this this previous lecture is that there's really two key questions that we want to ask after intubation, right? We've put a tube in someone's throat, we're put them on the ventilator, we're breathing for them now. The number one question is, it, did we put that tube in the right place, right? Because if it's not in the right place, bad things are going to happen pretty quickly. And we need to identify that rapidly, intervene upon that rapidly if we did something wrong. And if we did something right, then high fives all around, make sure the patient's sedated and you know, move on to the next thing. But that's the question number one. Question number two that we need to answer is, did we get this thing in an appropriate depth, right? Because if it's too high, it might pop out. If it's too low, we might be ventilating ventilating half of the lung tissue. And so we want to find that sweet spot. Um, you know, and we always get the chest x-ray to confirm and look and see if the tube, you know, terminates a couple of centimeters above the carina and all the good stuff that, you know, you've been trained to do. Uh, but those are the two key questions. Did we put it in the right right? place, put it down the right hole uh, in the airway. And did we get it deep enough, but not too deep, right? Again, the, I have the Goldilocks phenomenon in my head right now, the not too hot, not too cold, just right. 
Uh, so those are the two things. And those are the two questions that we're trying to get ultrasound to answer for us, right? And what we looked at last time is you can actually do a pretty decent job of ultrasounding an airway, right? So this is an example going from the um, the cartilage, kind of the cephalad cartilages, right? That it, we see kind of in that pointy edge. And then you come down and we get into like kind of the tracheal rings as we get to the bottom here. So you can see the kind of the, the airway narrowing down and that that whole white stripe in the middle reflects the air that's in the trachea. And as we've talked about, in past lectures and we talked about the last couple of weeks about air kind of gives that hyperechoic um anterior edge and then the dirty shadowing deep to it so we can see that air signature inside that airway uh, and that's kind of the the main anatomical structure that we're looking for and then the question is when we put the tube in and this is an example of you know seeing seeing that airway a little bit you know further down you can see the thyroid on either side but the question is when we put the tube in do we maintain one air filled structure or do we duplicate that if we put the tube in the esophagus right and so we'll show a couple examples here uh, of an airway in the trachea right um and so here's an example of well, actually this, i guess showing the anatomy but the trachea um the thyroid um on either side um and the esophagus is generally posterior and off to one side or the other my memory mike you can correct me if i'm wrong but my memory serves me correctly i think most patients it lives off to i want to say the left but that doesn't make sense physiologically so uh we'll have to have to dig back in that one but generally you'll see it posterior and off to one side um on patients um but as we scan if we put an extra air filled thing in that esophagus then we have to assume that we've intubated um the esophagus and so here's an example of putting air uh into that esophagus temporarily right um now you can look in long axis right you can see the tracheal cartilage or the thyroid cartilage um cephalad the cricoid cartilage kind of at the the right hand side of the screen or the you know caudad uh, on this image in that thin white line which is the cricothyroid membrane if you kind of think back we just finished this lung module uh with a couple lectures on lung if you kind of think back it kind of has that plural line look to it right it's kind of that thin white line that's just deep uh to two different cartilaginous structures right and so those are the the landmarks that we're looking for and then obviously if you scan down you can see various different tracheal rings um you know and actually in this one we're scanning up but you can see the tracheal rings off to the right cricocartilage that cricoid membrane and then as we get to the end of the clip you can see the 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 bottom edge of that thyroid cartilage right and so that's kind of your anatomy here's a couple examples that we showed of getting the the et tube in the right place so on the left you see the trachea right an air-filled trachea and on the right you have an air-filled esophagus right and so this would represent um a uh an intubation that happened in the esophagus and i think uh well here's an example that we'll show here this is from a study that was published uh, a while back um dr werner one of our colleagues and one of our faculty here did this study um where essentially they went to the or they consented patients they blinded kind of the sonographer who was there um and told the anesthesiologist okay pull a tap like pull a number out of a bin right that's randomized to either esophageal or tracheal intubation and then do what's it what's said on that piece of paper and see if the sonographer gets it right um and then they would rapidly extubate the the trachea or the esophagus and put it in the trachea before any untoward outcomes happened right but what they were able to show is that there's a high accuracy of um, detection of esophageal intubations in these patients um that were in this or setting uh that they scan and actually uh sandy tells the story um amusingly so that the surgeons were getting into it and they were kind of trying to guess you know whether it was the airway was in the esophagus of the trachea as well um but anyway this is what you're going to be looking for to answer that question is the tube in the right location right um and so here's an example um of oops click through it too quickly uh here's an example of just a tracheal intubation um where you can see uh just that air signature kind of changing a little bit in the trachea but you see no air signature in that esophagus which in this example is just inferior or just deep to and just to our right of that trachea right and so an example of a, a good intubation right it's in the right place um you can see that air signature in the reverberations um as a result of the air in the trachea so again that answers the question is the tube in the right place right we're good to go there the problem that we've run into uh over the years is we've had a hard time answering the question is did we get it in the right 
depth, all right? And there's been a lot of studies that have been performed uh, over the years that have looked at, okay, let if, what if we do lung sliding on both sides? If we have bilateral lung sliding, does that count? Well, I guess you could make an argument that it is, but again, you don't know where that tube is. So there's a lot of confounders there, whether you don't have lung sliding or whether you do have lung sliding on one side. Um, and then, I don't know, about a decade ago, um, there was a study that was published out of Canada looking at kids, and they used this idea of filling the tracheal balloon with saline. Um, and I saw that, I mean, that had a lot of promise, right? Because they could look at the supersternal notch and see if they could find that saline filled balloon. Um, and then there was, a, I guess, a few studies. I think, Mike, you guys published some um, looking at that same technique um, between 2014 uh, and now. But that leads us up to um, the topic of the rest of today's conversation, and that is um, this study, right? This this article that um, Dr. Gottlieb and his team have put out, basically comparing the dynamic versus the static ultrasound to confirm endotracheal tube depth, right? Um, and what I'd like to do um, is basically start with the conclusion, um, and then um, I'd like to kind of walk through, or have Mike walk through with us the basically the various different phases of this study, right? The introduction methods, results, um, discussion, and kind of help us understand this paper a little bit better, understand what it means, how to apply this data um, so that when we go to the bedside, either today or tomorrow, or whenever we're back on shift again, we have some actionable, actionable data intel that we can take to help uh, the patients that we see. So that said, the conclusion um, was ultrasound was highly accurate for determining the, the ET tube depth or tracheal, endotracheal tube depth with no statistically significant difference between the static and the dynamic techniques. So on its face, successful study. We now have an answer to the question of depth, but we have a few things that are um, that this conclusion kind of brings up as questions like, how do we get there? What does this mean? So with that said, um, maybe Mike, if you could just start off by introducing the paper, like tell us, you know, you guys did a really nice job in the background describing kind of the, the landscape, but kind of tell us kind of what's going on in the current landscape of airway ultrasound. Um, what was the knowledge gap that this paper was trying to address, um, you know, as we kind of dive into this? Absolutely. So a lot of the airway ultrasound literature is really focused on the location. You said that piece one is it tracheal is esophageal? And there's a lot of really good data on that. There's something like 40 plus studies that have shown that it is upwards of 96 to 100% sense of it's specific. So we know it's a really good test. There's very few medicine that kind of parallel that level. In fact, even entails capnography and cardiac arrest is in the 60 to 70% accuracy rate when they're you know not in ROSC. And so it's a really good test. And then our team's like, why are people not using this? And that led us to think a little bit more about central lines. We know that we can trace, use ultrasound to trace our, you know, our uh, guide wire to prove it's in the right location. And we know we can test for pneumothoraces. And for a very long time, people are like, yeah, this is great. And I'm going to get an x-ray. This is great. I'm getting an x-ray. And then the culture started to shift a little bit as people started using bubble studies or other mechanisms to say, okay, wait a second. I can actually confirm depth now too, to show it's in the right location, it's at the right depth, and there's no complications. So why not apply the same thing to airway ultrasound? That barrier of, oh, I need an x-ray um, starts to go away when you're like, okay, I can assess with ultrasound not only is it in the right location, but is it at the right depth? Um, so it allows us to start to look at that and whether you're using it to, you know, downstream to reduce the need for x-rays or at least to allow us to make a diagnosis faster than x-ray, um, I think there's a lot of value in there. Most of the time, if I'm calling for an overhead, you know, X-ray after intubation, it takes time. And if that tube is, you know, main stemmed or it's not, you know, it's right at the edge of the vocal cord is about to pop out, that's a long time to wait for it to, you know, be assessed. Or let's say the patient comes in via EMS and the tube is placed pre-hospital and either it's shifted or the patient was shifted and now they've, you know, again, advanced it to a different location. Wouldn't it be great if we could assess that immediately at the bedside in something that takes between 10 to 15 seconds to do? as opposed to waiting for an x-ray. So we wanted to study that. I think that's a great point. And you know, one of the things that we, um, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, one of the things that we get kind of hung up on um, is the fact that in a highly resourced center, we have, you know, just these really smooth workflows where we do the intubation and then we get the x-ray and then things like happen because we have the resources at our disposal. Uh, but we, if we change the variable a little bit, all of a sudden the dynamic 
significantly changes, right? And so the context I was speaking to the other day was, you know, well, what about if you don't have, you know, like in this case, you know, doing like pelvic ultrasound or gallbladder ultrasound uh, in the ED versus if you don't have a sonographer overnight, right? You know, that all of a sudden the need to learn the, the point of care study changes dynamically, even though like at the main shop, we have it overnight. So I think that's really critical to think through kind of, okay, maybe I'm going to have an x-ray at the bedside and maybe after I intubate, you know, I'm going to shoot the film because I need to know what's going on in the lungs as well as in the airway that I just fixed. Um, but let's change that dynamic. It's two in the morning in the ICU, right? That's something different. Or it is 10 in the afternoon and you're in the back of a helicopter uh, and you don't have an x-ray machine, right? And so I think some of these different, you know, unique scenarios kind of, again, create that that niche and that hole and that need to fill uh, or that gap to fill that I think this paper can potentially get at. So um I guess another, so we talked a little bit about like, why did you do the study? Kind of some, some of the goals of, of the study, but I think what were you, when you went into the study, obviously you didn't, you had enough background information because you said this has been your kind of academic interest since residency, but you had some background information to kind of have an idea of where things were going, but what did you expect that you would find? Like, did you expect to find a positive study or like, Hmm, I have no clue what's going to happen. You know, let's test it and find out. That was one of the more interesting things that came out of this. Um, we had done a prior study of looking at this. It was a little bit of a different study um, as it looked at like three different variables, including how high the tube was, mm -hmm. as opposed to just is it, you know, deeper, is it in the right location? But when we did the prior work, we found that it was good, but it wasn't great. And we saw some areas where people were, you know, uncomfortable sometimes not being able to fully see the tube. And as we evolved our, you know, our approach to this, we started to think about some of our prior work we've done looking at static versus dynamic and eventually this kind of twisting phenomenon that if you can create motion artifact, you help to see better in the trachea. People are not struggling with esophage identifying esophageal intubations. Those ones people are generally highly accurately, highly confident, very quick with. And we've seen some work on that and we've done some work on that too. Um, it's when we get to the trachea, that people are a little more uncomfortable because you're trying to battle with this space of, okay, I have air blocking my view. So unless you're completely abutting it, it's a little bit trickier to see. And so you start to add layers into it, whether you're twisting your tube to create motion artifacts, whether you're doing it in real time, whether you're using saline to start to block that air and improve your visibility. And we said, well, why not apply that to depth as well? Rather than just trying to identify this statically, if I can watch it inflate, I should be able to see it a lot better. I can see, look for that motion, our eyes will cue into that. So I expected that going into this, that they would both be very relatively accurate, but there'd be a relatively big difference between them. And it turned out that, you know, the group did really well on both. It was still better, not statistically, but if we look at the absolute numbers, it was a little bit better using static or using dynamic, watching it actually inflate. And people were a little more comfortable with that. But we could pick it up with both, which was, I think, a little reassuring there, too, insofar as if you didn't want to use stat the dynamic, you didn't feel comfortable inflating in real time, you still have really high accuracy as a baseline across these users. So that I think that was also... Um, somewhat unexpected from what we thought we would see in terms of differences, but in a really beneficial way that allows us to expand the usage. Cool. Well, with that said, I think we've raised a lot of questions like, what in the world are we talking about? Like move static, dynamic, motion artifact, airways, ET tubes. Like, so let's dive into a little bit of the methods. So um, I guess, can you summarize your um, your study protocol here? Like basically big picture, you know, I'm on the elevator with you going from ground floor to first floor. You're telling me you're doing a study. Big picture, what's the protocol? And then we'll dive into some of the details here. Yeah. So the big picture was we were randomizing the, in the cadaver model, we we're randomizing whether the depth assessment will be done with static versus dynamic. So static consists of, I inflate, you know, I, I intubate the patient to a randomized depth. And it's either at the correct location or, or deep near main stem. And I would inflate it with saline. We use saline because it's actually very hard to see this with air for depth assessment. So we use saline for all of them. And then we would assess them either statically is in the right location from there, or dynamically, it would actually be inflated in real time under ultrasound visualization. And then we would assess three things with that. We would say, number one, tell me, you know, we'd ask the uh, sonographer and we had seven different sonographers in our study and we would ask them to make their assessment and we compare it against the um, actual location of it. We would ask them their confidence using a one to five Likert scale to, because if they're not confident, but they're correct, it doesn't, it means 
nothing because they probably won't use it. So when are they actually confident enough to use this clinically? And then the last thing being, how long did it take? Because again, similarly, if it takes a very long time, um, you and I were talking earlier uh, before the session started about trying to confirm a central line with a TEE. And it's great, but if this is a whole long process that's very complicated and takes a ton of time, then this is unlikely to be used. So we assessed this and it was very quick as well. So that was the other item we wanted to see a census list. Is it fast? Are people confident? And are they accurate? Gotcha. So big picture for those listening, ET tubes in, need to know the depth, squirt the bubble or the balloon with saline. And I either do it before I evaluate with ultrasound or do it while I'm evaluating with ultrasound, looking to see if there's any changes in accuracy, confidence, and um, I and uh, yeah. speed time. I was blanking for just a second on that third one. Um, so with that said, I think let's, let's kind of nitpick a little bit on some of these things. Maybe not nitpicks the wrong word, but like, let's get very granular here. You defined a confirmed airway. Cause I think when we're doing stats, you know, one of the things I tell people, uh, and I'm the world's most lousy researcher um, and stats person, but um, one of my favorite articles that I like to quote all the time is a BMJ article about the fact that uh, jumping out of an airplane with a backpack versus a parachute is statistically not different um, in terms of mortality. Like the same number of people didn't die with a backpack and with a, with a parachute. And everyone looks at me, it's like, are you nuts? Like, of course, if you jump out of an airplane with a backpack, you'll die. And if you have a parachute, you might not die. Um, and then when I say, well, the airplane was parked on the ground and they jumped three feet, you know, everyone's like, oh, that makes sense. Right. Um, but what I like to bring up with that one is methods matter. Right. Um, so how you design a study really affects the outcome. And I think one of the sinister things about research is you can design a study in such a way that you can kind of manipulate the answer that you get. And so a good study uh, is one that kind of is very careful with the definitions, very careful with the design so that you get an actionable um, and, a, and a, a result that most closely approximates truth, right? Um, and so I guess that rabbit trail <laughs> aside, I don't know if I was intending to go all the way in there. Um, whereas the point I was trying to make is Definitions are very, very critical um, to understand what is being studied and then the, the generalizability um, for for our population. So with that said, let's kind of say definition of a confirmed airway. You talked about it in your um, in your paper, but um, how, how did you guys conf define a confirmed airway? So for the confirmed in, in this context, we're talking about depth. We defined it as something that was below the sixth tracheal ring, perfect timing on the slide advancement. <laughs> and so as we go through that, we we basically pulled this from a couple items. And one, we've done some prior work. We As we went through when we would intentionally main stem them under fiber optic bronchoscopy, that's about as far as you'll see where you'll see the tube around six to eight centimeters and when it's pretty much main stem down there because the way the ultrasound beam shoots through there. Um, so that gave us kind of as a, a approximation from there. And um, similarly, once you approach that past that level, that's when you have a very high risk of main stemming with any degree of movement. So we took that as a surrogate of that's a that's one that would likely need to be pulled back. The goal mm -hmm. being really we wanted around, you know, the second to sixth tracheal rings are approximately a good rough standard of where the tube should be. So as long as it's within that two to six, that's where it, typically if you would say I'm happy with that is an X-ray. And so we use that as parallel for ultrasound. Anything deeper than that would likely an X-ray. And when you did, you'd say, ah, I just need to pull that back about one, two centimeters. I think you mentioned somewhere in there that you said the cephalad or the superior edge of the balloon. Is that correct? You know, is between correct. those two landmarks. And I think, um, would it be fair to say between the cricoid and the sixth or between the second and the sixth? Or does it, you know, the superior edge did not matter so much? We used second and sixth. Um, cricoid gets a bit close to the vocal cords. Okay. So for our definitions, we said is between the, the second and sixth is an acceptable range that allows us a little bit of movement of the head without um, risking some dislodgement either direction. Sure. And um, I am going to um, advance to some images here that you sent me. Um, so we can kind of illustrate that a little bit. Um, here we go. We'll cut back. There we go. So in this example, um, I, so you sent me an image of high, medium or high, mid and low, and they're kind of in that left to right order. So um, here you can see that saline filled balloon um, on the left, right above the cricoid cartilage. So if you can see the star, um, that's the cricoid card or cricoid um, ring, right? The first ring, um, the cricoid cartilage would be above it. 
Um, and then below it, you those little lumps are the, the the subsequent rings, right? So the balloon is you know at and a little bit above that um, cricoid ring um, on the, the left image. Um, kind of conversely, on the far right image, the balloon uh, is not really well visualized at all. Um, it's below those those rings, and then in the the middle image, it's kind of in that neighborhood of I think the if I'm reading it correctly, the balloon is kind of at that between first and second ring. Is that Am I looking at that correctly there for you? Uh, it's at the second in that one. It, that was I see the like arrow pretty much right at the limit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking for is seeing kind of that ETT balloon um, in that general vicinity. Um, so we'll go back to so this definition. Um, so we talked a little bit about the protocol. We talked about how you chose the sixth tracheal ring. I thought it was interesting with the, the previous um, you know, bronchoscopy. Uh, techniques. I know we mentioned this a little bit, but um, explain a little bit the static versus dynamic technique. Um, you know, let's clear, like get you know some clarity around that. Yeah, absolutely. So this, the intention here really is with static, you're filling up, as I mentioned, kind of with saline. The saline will allow you to see it, but the challenges still remain in terms of you're looking through this and like, it's almost like hunting across the screen, mm -hmm. looking for that tube when it's obvious, that's great. And you'll pick it up. And that's why I think there was generally a very high accuracy in the first place, but it does require a little bit of hunting across the screen and it's sometimes gonna be a little more challenging. And that's where we found um, in some of our prior work, it just took a hit to confidence to people. So they're like, I think that's it. It's probably it. What do you use it clinically? I don't think so. And then when we did dynamic, when we started testing this model out, you could just see it inflate and you felt very, people have felt very confident, very comfortable identifying that. So with dynamic, and I, I think hopefully there's a video to show that too. You can actually like watch it really dilate in, in real time and there's no ambiguity there. You know exactly what you're looking at. Yeah, I got that um, clip so that coming up here soon. Um, and then the last question on methods is, um, you mentioned you had seven sonographers. Who are your sonographers? So we had five uh, ultrasound fellowship trained faculty. Um, and then we had two brand new attendings um, who are actually our ultrasound fellows in their first month. They had no prior airway ultrasound uh, experience. So they were treated as effectively a um, average user in that regard. Um, gotcha. We actually did a lot of kind of pieces in there too, um, just to note in there as you're thinking through for those who may be thinking about doing similar types of models. Um, if you're pushing something deep, you inherently are going to see the tube sticking out real far or not. Um, so we did, we included putting towels over their face. We had intubators who would leave the room after the intubation so that they couldn't make facial expressions to show where it might've been to be like, you know, that moment that we see, sometimes you, you see that, you know, we're teaching our, our, our learners is that, you know, the, the view isn't quite right. And you're like, I know what I need you to do. Um, and so we tried to remove all those forms of bias in there and really keep everyone blinded to it, where it was. Mm -hmm. Um, so they would try to remove any of that potential influence there. Did you intentionally tell your intubators to to tube to a certain depth or did you just kind of dis discover what was what they had done and fixed it? No, they were randomized. We randomized 50 50. We did um, everything was an a priori. So we had a spreadsheet that was made months in advance um, okay. to remove any potential you know, memory components of it. It was randomized across every single intubation at 50 50. So we could test the test characteristics a bit better. Um, and then the intubator would just follow that protocol one after another, after another. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so, um, you mentioned the fellow, like the early fellows and the faculty. Um, how do you think this affects generalizability to, let's say we're taking it to, uh, you know, one of two scenarios, right? You could either take it to a residency program. That's where you and I are at, or we take it out to the community. You know, are there any issues with generalizability based on this design? Yeah, and that's it's one of the interesting things, and I always kind of harp on this when I'm talking through our through studies, um, is that when you have a really wide range of users, it only works when you're really accurate. Outside of there, you have to you then have to subgroup and look at them across it because it doesn't really help you if, if you know we don't know where the if their middle accuracy if it's dragged down by one group or another or how it sits. Um, thankfully, in our case, everyone was you know equally accurate, accurate, and we actually subgroup them by the average users versus mm -hmm. the kind of super users and found absolutely no difference across the board. Um, so I think that was really helpful for us to start to look at this. The other area um, that we looked at as well is the concept, the, um, the degree of just training involved in this, because if I'm doing a, you know, a four hour study protocol where I'm teaching you every single, you know, having you do like hundreds of assessments and really kind of push for that, then it's not really very reprodu reproducible because people are going to not want to do that much training. 
So for ours, we did 10 minutes of training. That was it. It was a very short training session to people who had never done this before, um, or the vast majority of our group had not done this before. And so we found that it still had really high accuracy, even with a relatively simple training protocol, which is also, I think, helpful for generalizability. Ultimately, though, this is, you know, it does have the areas that number one is a cadaver study. So mm -hmm. it does need to be, you know, replicated in, you know, live patients and, you know, wide ranges of them. And similarly, it's still a group of seven of us, but it's, you know, seven people. And so there does need to be additional studies that kind of, you know, further externally validate this assess across, you know, further populations. But at least this initial data is very promising. Gotcha. So um, let's move on to, uh, well, I created this slide. I forgot to head in here for you. Um, basically, des describing the static versus dynamic essentially is when do you put that? I mean, all the t all the balloons got inflated. Is, it sounds like, and so is when did you do the scan before or after the inflation? So, uh, with that said, let's move on to the results um, of the study and kind of talk a little bit about what you guys found because um, that will tee up kind of how we're going to interpret the results here. So, uh, oops, as we mentioned here, um, this was the the, the slide we showed earlier with the high, the mid, and the low. And I don't think we need to go back and further describe that because we just talked about that a few minutes ago. Um, but a couple of videos that you sent, here's an example um, of a appropriately placed, well, this is the um, the dynamic technique where you can see the movement um, of that ET balloon or the saline filled balloon um, in real time. Um, and I think I described any comments that you want to have on this one that I didn't hit? No, it's a, this is a, you know, we, I gave you, I pulled one of the examples of each just to kind of, you know, draw, drive this home and see it. But you can see how easily it is to just see, watch that dilate on that right side of the exactly. screen. Um, it just adds, so it added such an additional level of, if, even if not accuracy, just comfort amongst our group of saying, oh yeah, I definitely see this dilating. There's not anything else this, this is going to be. And then obviously the, the null, example that you gave me was this an example of uh too deep or just not seen it at all or the static uh both both, both. it's it this it's one static. was this one was deep it was a, it was a main stem that's similar to the reason you just don't see it really on the screen at all yeah so you can see the the cricoid ring at the top and then the thyroid or the um tracheal rings kind of along the middle of the image and then obviously i think i'm seeing the tip of the balloon way way at the right hand side of the screen uh, but there's not enough screen to be able to to say for sure um, but, uh, I, I guess that leads us to essentially your results. And I summarized it with these, these three tables and I thought they were interesting, um, static technique versus dynamic technique, sensitivity and specificity. Um, both were, were decently good. Um, that, that dynamic outperformed just a little bit. Um, and then you mentioned, um, accuracy, um, of your expert and non-expert sonographers. So, um, do you want to, kind of break down some of the results here and and describe what you found and kind of what this means? Of course. Um, so for the, as you can see up there, the static was about 99% sensitive, 97% specific. Um, dynamic caught all the cases. So the, really the only misses that existed were all in the static group. Um, anytime we're reading, you know, diagnostic accuracy testing, it's really important to look at the 95% confidence intervals because if I say it's 100% accurate, it could be as low as 50%, that's a big deal. If we say it's 100 percent accurate and maybe as low as you know 96 percent, they may I may feel more comfortable with that kind of range. Um, and so thankfully we had a really relatively large study, so we were able to narrow down those confidence intervals, um, which gives us a little bit more comfort in terms of what at least you know the rough range of this will be. Um, and then as you can see on kind of the other tables there, we looked at this amongst the experts and you know the non-experts, and you can see that they're relatively similar in terms of their um, you know their accuracy across the two groups. And again, all the dynamics across the board were able to be successfully identified regardless of uh, expertise. Gotcha. And I'm looking, I didn't put the this into the slide set, it, mostly because I think it was just not in the form of a table, uh, but you commented in the results paragraph uh, about the time, you said for experts, the time to identification was slightly faster for the static at 6.7 seconds, obviously with the bounding bars on that, and then compared to the dynamic of nine seconds with bounding bars. Um, and then confidence, you said was lower for the static, six, four point six out of five on that Likert scale with you know with a, a range, and then compared to the dynamic of four point eight point or four point eight to five over five um, for the dynamic technique. And then for the non-experts, time to identification 
was approximately the same, 6.5 seconds versus 8.2 seconds. And the non-expert confidence was 4.1. So their confidence was a little bit lower um, on both counts, 4.1 uh, for static, 4.5 for the dynamic. Um, and the the um, the bounding bars decently, I look, looking at it, they decently either abut one another, but don't terribly overlap, it looks like. They kind of, it seems like it is a reasonably statistic statistically significant finding would you is that kind of how you read that correct uh, ultimately the you know the timing for both are relatively short um there's always that split of it could be statistically significant but is it clinically significant and the differences yeah. between 6.6 .6 and 8.7 under 10 seconds is i think a very quick test as far as you know imaging exists um and well, honestly it's the time the that it takes well. to inflate the balloon yeah <laughs> That we was just yeah. discovered statistically how long it takes <laughs> to inflate an ETT balloon. Congratulations. So, that was the point. Yeah, that's really the take home. I should cut the conclusion to talk about that. Um, but no, and then the other thing in there is the, the, the confidence. When we use that Likert scale, you know, it was a rough gauge, um, a four out of five it, are, you know, is, is sufficient for proving anyone to use it clinically. Um, that's a, you know, it's kind of, it's very too extremely confident. So that's something that, you know, all of our users felt very comfortable with. Um, and we saw, you know, amongst that subgroup, when we look at the non-experts, it went, it went as low as, you know, 4.1 and really the range 3.9 to 4.3. So that was really the only one where you started to edge into that kind of, you know, rough probable use. Mm -hmm. But otherwise for dynamic, I mean, they were very high, almost five point, almost five out of five on the Likert scale. So that makes them, you know, I think that we can use as a circuit to say, not only is it accurate, but people feel comfortable using it. Which I think that, I mean, it's an interesting point. Um, and I want to maybe use that as a segue to get into the discussion. Because um, my questions are basically, how do you envision emergency providers using this technique? Um, and maybe the better kind of segue question is, did you have, either did you at the time, or do you now have kind of this rough understanding of like, what your floor Likert scale of confidence would be, that would be something that, you know, below this, yeah, it's not really a viable technique because no one's going to want to do it versus above this, like, oh, this is, this is reasonable. Like, I think people might, you know, who are reasonably adept to, to new things would want to try. It's a good question. It's going to, I think the, the kind of the threshold, the liquid scale is going to vary, vary depending on the user and the time point. Mm -hmm. Um, so part of it is going to be the comfort, right? So in a sonophile like me is probably more adept to use something at an even lower confidence level than a, you know, a user who rarely uses ultrasound. And it's, that confidence threshold is going to vary based on the person. It's going to base next, it's going to vary based on the literature, right? Where this is now versus where this was 10 years ago versus where this will be in 10 years. Mm -hmm. We'll adjust that confidence the same way that we've seen for ultrasound for intubation confirmation for tracheal versus esophageal is different now. And I think the threshold at which people will diagnose with lower, you know, confidence scales versus, you know, almost uh, 20 years ago when Dr. Werner's first paper started coming out. Um, I think that the dynamic and the acceptability has changed, um, even, even if the confidence scale hasn't adjusted that much. That yeah. said, even without, you know, there's no validated threshold that I've seen in this exact confidence is going to be the number for the, a lot of the reasons I mentioned that it's very personalized in nature and even acuity based based on the person. But I take as, you know, brands pretty close to five. That's a good sign that people are going to be very confident and comfortable using this. So how do you, I mean, the future is kind of hard to predict, but, um, and, and people, and human behavior is really hard to predict. Um, but based on the study, the findings that you have here, um, how do you envision um, emergency physicians or even critical care physicians? Because I know we have a lot of people in crit care that listen to this. Um, or maybe the better question to start off with is how is this data impacted your practice? And then obviously you and I are you know, admitted sonophiles. Um, so maybe your less sonophilic um, colleagues, you know, how has this data impacted their practice um, as we kind of move from the theoretical bench side to the I'm at the bedside? That's an excellent question. Um, I think we're doing research really in general. It's how do we enact change and impact? And it's not just about getting, you know, a paper out there or something that people are like, oh, that's really cool. And then move on with their lives. Like how do we enact change? And fortunately, enacting change is really hard. Um, you have to, you have to prove it and you have to allow time for it to kind of sink in and people to, you know, absorb this. Um, so I see a couple of stages of this carrying forward. The step one is just the quick bedside assessment. If you're still going to get an x-ray, at least I can assess this more quickly. I can build up skill sets among increasing numbers of users 
And if I'm, you know, before the actually comes back, I can make those diagnoses and adjust it and impact my patient's care by, for example, you know, pulling the tube back a little bit or similarly in some of our other work, seeing that the tube is right at that, cricho, you know, right at that cricothyroid membrane, it's really up high and I need to advance it. And I don't really want to wait for the x-ray and then getting jostled around for the tube to come out. So it's going to be that first level. I think the next level is going to have to be is us feeling comfortable internally as a, as a specialty in emergency medicine of saying, okay, I don't need to get this x-ray anymore. This is, I feel very comfortable with it is. And that's going to go almost hand in hand with, okay. And then the next person that's going to see them also has to feel equally comfortable because if I don't get an x-ray and yep. then they go upstairs and they immediately get an x-ray or they call me and say, why is this patient have an x-ray? That's not saving anything. That's just delaying their care in a way that doesn't actually benefit them. Um, and so it really has to start to be in that, enacting that culture change. But going back to how we you know, started a lot of this, this all, a lot of this began when we look at central lines and the culture changed to say not every central line is a chest x-ray. That took time. That took work. It took serial studies. But now we're getting there. And I'd like us to follow the same thing here. Yeah, I remember that was kind of the hot topic when I'm, um, you and I were training. It was, like, it was the edgy thing to do. It was like, don't get that chest x-ray. You just do ultrasound. Um, and so it's kind of this will be the n- nice new fun edgy thing to to pursue um well i think that's good um so i think maybe just to summarize um you know kind of our findings here prior to today's conversation prior to this paper you know this is the the state of play right the key questions after intubation were right location right depth where ultrasound was good on one of them maybe struggled a little bit on the other one um but now that we've had this data we're starting to accumulate data i think the trust study was the first one that really brought it to my mind you know 10 years ago and then fast forward now 10 years you've got this paper and the one you published i think it was two years ago in 2021 that was the preparatory paper for this one we're really starting to kind of move that needle a little bit saying perhaps ultrasound can show us um that the tube is in the right depth and if we've showed um a way that that can that question can be answered and so again like mike said continuing to amass that data uh to convince not only yourself but those who come behind us and i've i've often said said to to our trainees ultrasound is as good as the person who's willing to act on it right and so for us in the department I'm the primary actor so it's really easy but then getting it upstairs if you don't have a a um an intensivist or someone like that who's who's confident in that that finding then that that that's going to need some time and need some change so anyway with that said um i think that's a pretty good summary of this paper mike did you have anything else you wanted to to mention that we didn't hit um you know about this specific paper that you guys put out not the specific paper in general but for airway ultrasound ultrasound in general help us continue pushing the field this is what we need to do. We need to continue to push the limits of where we thought this wasn't and where we thought we we don't do this. Um, going back to when air, you know, lung ultrasound came along and they said, why would you scan through something that's all air to where it's now a core part of my practice and many of ours? I think we need to start to push the limits on what we said we couldn't do to what we can do and to start publishing more and more and demonstrate that. So when our colleagues look at this, it becomes less of a, this is a really kind of fringe activity you're doing to why are you not doing this? And how do we get this upstairs? So someday we'll have the textbook of ultrasound guided airway management. And this will be the core centerpiece of it. So wonderful. Uh, well, thank you so much for being a part of uh, today's Grand Rounds. Um, I personally enjoyed reading this article and kind of adding it to the, the armamentary of things that we can do uh, in the ED. And I personally enjoyed having the conversation, having you as part of our, our forum here. Um, I guess before we before we cut out, um, is there are there any questions kind of about the the article, ultrasound topics that Mike uh, could answer for us? And by any questions, Catherine, do you have any questions? I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to say awesome article. I think this is would be really great also for like attendings who are supervising intubations. If um, your resident wants to attempt DL, you really obviously can't look over their shoulder and <laughs> get the view that they're seeing. So this can kind of help you in real time determine whether or not they're doing the correct thing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, awesome job. Thanks so much for coming to lecture for us. All right. Well, with that said, let's, let's wrap things up here. Um, 
So if you um, enjoyed seeing this lecture and want to see more, definitely feel free to go over to our YouTube channel, youtube.com, search for Metro Health Emergency Ultrasound. We've got a lot of great content up there. I think it's great, but I also put out most of it. So uh, <laughs> uh, give us a like if you agree. If you don't, you can do the thumbs down or just don't say anything. Um, but Mike, thanks again for joining us today, uh, for being part of today's forum, um, for really doing a lot of great ultrasound research and really pushing the field uh, forward in ways that I'm, I'm definitely not as skilled at. You know, the research is not something I have the <laughs> the skill set or the temperament to do. And so um, definitely appreciate people like you who um, who really dive into the, the weeds on this and kind of put out some stuff that then we can use at the bedside. So uh, thanks for joining us. Um, look forward to kind of continuing to collaborate in the future and and seeing you around the the conference circuit. So, great! Thank um, you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for coming.